All right, so welcome to video two in my reading of Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen. This video will focus on book one. If you haven't seen the introduction, I'd recommend you to start there. And as I mentioned in the introduction, um, even though Edmund Spencer is uh, sometimes praised as being of the same quality as, say, John Milton in Paradise Lost or anything by William Shakespeare, he's not nearly as widely read, and that is because it's simply that much more difficult to read. He's writing an allegory, but he's intentionally presenting images that are too complicated for the reader to process in real time in order to alert the reader to the fact that this is an allegory for the, the literal meanings to be transcended towards something else. And what that something else was, was both the sort of universal religious concern of dealing with, you know, John Calvin's revelation that, um, you know, uh, you're not simply as fallen as can be quantified by how many sins you've committed. You're inherently an original sin in a world that is inherently fallen, and the only way you can be saved is by being part of the elect, which God has chosen um, from time beginning and not really made manifest except through the call, where even though you didn't choose yourself to be saved, you still have to chose to be, you still have to choose, I should say, to be saved. Um, and each, each book is going to therefore be episodic. It's going to deal with a specific virtue battling against a specific vice. And rather than have um, book one continue the story of book two explicitly, there is still going to be a story underlying the whole thing. Paradoxically, only in glimpses, the story underlying the whole book is, of course, uh, King Arthur's quest for the Fairy Queen. Uh, King Arthur only making a brief appearance in each book. And the Fairy Queen largely functioning through her absence throughout the, the epic. Uh, and I want to focus in this video on book one, which deals with the story of the Red Cross Knight and the virtue of holiness. Now, book one is, in a lot of ways, a dramatization of Paul's theology that even though man is fallen, he still has to, in some way, uh, cast off the old corrupt man and put on the new man of really of, of virtue and and doing that not even through his own um, works, but rather through the intervention of grace, which is going to play a big role. And in a lot of ways, this is a rewriting of some other texts that were important to him. On the one hand, you have the revelation in the book, in the Bible, where you have images like the red dragon, which obviously plays a big role in book one, the whore of Babylon. Hope you're not offended by me using that word, um, which is also going to be embodied by the figure of Duessa, but also as a critique, of course, theologically or politically, I guess you could say, uh, between his understanding of the Church of England as the true church versus the Church of Rome as the false church. Hope you're not offended by me saying that. That's just the historical context of this book. But there's also going to be the woman clothed with the sun in the book of Revelation, which for him is the double of the whore of Babylon, Duessa, which is uh, the figure of Una, who represents the true church, which is really not a worldly institution, but the elect, as God has chosen them to be the elect from the beginning of time. And of course, there's also the legend of St. George. Now, um, the Red Cross Knight is uh, the knight fighting dragons, which of course is, you know, a reference to the battle with the dragon in the book of Revelation, but equally important, a reference to the figure of St. George as the knight of England who fights the dragon, but also fills in the nationalist role of providing an epic for England, the way that the Aeneid provided an epic for Rome. And therefore, um, the, uh, the imagery of book one is going to largely be thought of in terms of England's relation to the other powers of Europe. England at that time felt like a threatened power trying to uh, live out a Protestant um, institution against the largely Roman Catholic monarchies of Europe, especially Spain. And this is going to be conceptualized allegorically within this book through the figures of Una and Duessa. Now, the nice thing here is that the allegorical signification of the character is largely captured within sort of a literal reading of the name. So, for example, Una is going to be the unity of truth, and Duessa is going to be the falsity of duplicity. And um, Una is also going to have certain images to be associated with what exactly would the true church look like. Well, she's going to be a figure of humility. She's going to be riding on a donkey. Uh, she's going to be the figure of the lamb, which uh, the true church is symbolized in the book of Revelation as, as restored after the defeat of the whore of Babylon. 
and as the truth, she's going to be one because truth is indivisible. The the difficulty is, or the difference is that Duessa is going to be um, the opposite of that, in that whereas Una is um, not the worldly institution of church, which according to Edmund Spencer, falls into idolatry. For example, when Una is um, in the forest and saved by the fawns and satyrs, their first reaction is to worship her. When she says, don't worship me, uh, they turn to worshiping the donkey. So the idea that the true church is not the worldly institution that asks for itself to be worshipped or to fall into lower forms of idolatry, but rather defers that praise only to God, um, Duessa is going to be the opposite of that. Uh, Duessa is going to be the figure of the whore of Babylon in the book of Revelation, and he's going to explicitly say that whereas Una is the daughter of king and queen, whose kingdom was not a regional kingdom, but sort of a universal kingdom encompassing both east and west, Duessa is going to be the daughter of an emperor who ruled the west. His idea that the Church of Rome is just a regional church of western Europe and he's going to explicitly say that um, the emperor, that is the father of Duessa, uh, had a throne where Tiberius used to sit, obvious reference to Rome. And therefore, whereas Duessa is the duplicity of a partial uh, rule over the over of a certain part of the earth, Una is going to be more like the mystical unity of truth as a universality. And therefore, um, Duessa is going to be... Um, somebody who largely works through deceit. Um, the Red Cross Knight, for example, is warned by a past victim in Canto 2, uh, verse 30 on, uh, by a man who Duessa transformed into a tree, but because the seduction of deception is so strong for Duessa, he actually fails to heed the warning of that guy, and she leads him to commit sin and go to um, the, the house uh, where... Um, the the house of pride, where uh, he, which is kind of a representation of the wide and open road Jesus references in the gospel, as opposed to the house of holiness that Una is characterized by, which is the straight and narrow. She leads him down the path of sin, and um, she also literally makes the journey into hell, uh, the same sort of journey that you find in Dante, and as well as the Aeneid and the Odyssey. One of the hallmarks of a great epic is the journey into the underworld. She's going to make the journey literally into hell in order to revive the slain Saracen. Hopefully no offense to that motif. Also, Sansfoy. Now, there are some parallels. Um, Duessa seeks bodily healing for Sansfoy, but um, Una seeks the spiritual healing for the Red Cross. And that is really through the grace of God rather than something that you work for yourself. And after the trip to Hades, Duessa finds herself abandoned by the Red Cross Knight, um, but um, finds him, seduces him, but still betrays him, of course, and uh, this is going to mirror, in a certain sense, um, his abandonment of Duessa, or excuse me, of, of Una near the beginning, um, but um, that is something which, after the, the defeat of the giant Orgoglio, um, Una's wandering is going to end, the restoration of the kingdom is going to be soon, and then Duessa, when her true appearance is revealed by stripping her down to what she really is, which is a filthy and ugly um, and, and, and depraved um, sight, is going to be forced to go into wandering. Now, the Red Cross Knight is a type of the elect Christian. Um, he's going to, of course, not be a perfect embodiment of the virtues he seeks to do, but rather a fallen guy who cannot um, be saved except through the intervention of grace. And therefore, there's going to be something of the ambivalence of, um, of trying to exist in the fallen world but still have to take action. Now, he's going to be deceived many times. He'll be deceived by Archimago, uh, kind of another literal term where we have Archie and um, the idea of, of prime or beginning or, or top and then magic, kind of a top magician, and um, he, he's going to at first seem like a holy hermit, you know, with these very devout sort of uh, rituals, but he's actually not just a model of, of an evil person, but some interpret him as being uh, the devil himself within the book. And Archimago is going to provide the separation of the Red Cross from Una by producing a false double of Una, which, you know, for Spencer is kind of like a double of the true church, which still fools people. And... 
The Red Cross Knight is therefore going to spend much of Book One in separation from her after falling into the deceptions which the which Archimago provides. For example, Archimago has Red Cross Knight catch the false Una in bed with a squire who also doesn't really exist, and he's going to be deceived by that. Um, then there's the Orgoglio and the, the Ocean of Despair. He's going to um, be cast into a dungeon, and Arthur's going to fight the giant Orgoglio, but um, Red Cross is still going to be tempted later on to um, accept that he is so fallen as a person that he has no choice really but to commit suicide, and he almost does it. But he's saved from that by the intervention of Grace, who gives him hope, not from his own doing, but through the fact that he's called to be the elect. And therefore, for, Cal for Calvin and for, um, for Spencer, this is really the difference between the Old Testament despair versus the, um, the hope of the new covenant, quote-unquote, and uh, of being one of the elect. And therefore, uh, Canto... Uh, 11 and, and on is really going to lead to um, the sort of climatic battle um, in which Una, representing England or the true church, is um, going to try to restore her kingdom through the defeat of the dragon, which is kind of a reference to the book of Revelation as a dragon that um, is a threat not only to England or the true church, whatever, but uh, a threat on a, on a, to the whole cosmos. And the knight is going to um, accomplish this by um, having the grace intervene to save him. So it's not even him so much that defeats the dragon. And, of course, then he's going to be reunited with Una. The true church is going to be restored. The dragon will be dead. And... Um, of course, in good episodic fashion, Archimago will escape to uh, cause more havoc and to keep the story going.